All right, our next speaker, also from the University of Maryland, uh, got her degree from the old Yale School of Management prior to being in the new building, and she tells us many tales of how hard it was before compared to now. Uh, so we'll let her enjoy the new building a little bit with her talk. She's also a, an expert in consumer decision making and uh, is also at the University of Maryland. So uh, I, I, I hope there's no bias in our selection criteria, uh, but without further ado, here's Anastasia. Rebecca, did you walk away with a clicker by any chance? No. Oh, there it is. Thank you. No <laughs> um, it's great to be here. Honestly, it's a little bit of mixed feelings, right? It's a very different atmosphere physically, but the same people, which is awesome. Um, so I'm really glad to be back and see a lot of familiar faces. And I'm going to talk about the work uh, actually actually started my last year of PhD program, which is embarrassing to admit, but it's, it's been uh, a lot of work, and it worked out great in the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about a topic that doesn't get a lot of surprisingly attention in the marketing literature, it gets some attention in economics literature, on how consumers make choices about rental versus buying options. And the reason why we got interested in this topic is that probably last five or six years, the rental sort of industry has exploded, not only in the amount of sort of rental goods that people do uh, acquire, uh, due to economic crisis, but also what kind of things now we can rent, right? It used to be when you're thinking about rentals, you used to think about those rent a center stores that are a little bit creepy, a very small population of people go there because they don't have other choices, essentially. Now you can rent anything. My favorite examples, and also one of my favorite websites, is a website called Bag Borrow Steal, known as a Netflix for bags, where for a somewhat reasonable fee of two, three, four hundred dollars, uh, you can actually acquire temporary, a very nice designer bags of jewelry. And that's an example of where rental industry went, where, you know, traditionally we wouldn't think about actually renting those kind of goods. Highly recommend it, by the way. <laughs> Other examples, if you're like me, I'm, this is my teaching semester, I don't think my, any student in my classroom actually own a textbook anymore which may reflect on me as a professor, but I think that happens because now most of them actually rent them, right? Both the big players, Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, allow people to rent for a reasonable price, as well as a lot of new players enter. Chegg is a very big example here. It's pretty much swept the market and became a public uh, company a couple of months ago. And the price they charge is very similar to the one that you pay in your regular textbook store to buy a slightly used textbook, right? So the pricing sort of difference went away as well. And probably the most important example is what is happening in the movie industry, right? We don't buy physical DVDs anymore. There is a small category if you have kids and you really need to watch that Bambi movie 25 times a day. That's a different story. But for the most of movies that we actually watch, we don't physically buy them. And that's even true about digital downloads. If you look at what happened in terms of rentals, it's a huge market, particularly video on demand rentals, and it keeps going up. At the same time, digital sales are only 54 million, and they keep going down. And also, the prices for digital sales keep going down every year. So when we saw these couple of examples that the industry is kind of exploding, we ask ourselves a question, well, should we care? Do people actually make decisions differently when they're deciding which movie to rent versus when they're deciding which movie to buy? And we look at the literature. And the answer was, well, we have no idea, honestly, because nobody had looked at this before, because it wasn't a big deal. And people either completely ignore the rental industry or kind of treat it exactly the same as purchases. So it doesn't matter if you acquire a product for buy or for rent, people should make decisions exactly the same way. But obviously, that didn't ring to be true to us. There are a lot of reasons why those decisions might be very different. One of the very important reasons is this decision permanency versus or decision reversibility, right? If I acquire a product, be there a movie, textbook, you know, computer, et cetera, et cetera, it's gonna stay with me for a very long time, right? I can't really go back and change my decision without having some consequences, losing some money essentially, if I do that. So there's a risk of me foregoing better options in the future. I bought this book, but there might be some other book available gonna be better. I can't really uh, acquire another one. Uh, there's also a huge anticipated regret, right? This decision has long-term consequences. If I make a wrong decision, I'm going to be regretting it more than if I make sort of a simple rental decision that went wrong. 
And there are a couple other issues that used to be a big deal in comparing rent and, and buying decision, like differences in prices and disposal costs, right? If I buy something I don't like it, I actually have to physically get rid of it, which are really no longer a big deal if you're thinking about those exploding industries like movie streaming, right? Price is roughly the same. There is really no disposal cost if you're downloading something, but we want to keep those in mind as well. So what we're thinking, based on this idea of decision re reversibility, anticipated regret, is that we're going to expect that pe when people are making rental decisions, they're going to be less elaborate type of decisions. They're also going to be willing to accept a lot more different products because their acceptance threshold is going to be lower, right? I'm not thinking about long-term, uh, very elaborate decisions. And as a result, the likelihood of me saying yes to a rental versus saying yes to a purchase is going to be significantly higher. This is probably not particularly surprising. What we think is interesting is people are still applying the same kind of rules about renting and buying. They're using very different decision mindset. Even we put them in situations or into product categories where basic economic reasons that will work this way are no longer present. Even when we keep the prices the same, there are no disposal costs, and even if a control for consumption lacks, right? If I rent versus buy a textbook, I'm only going to use it for six months, no matter what, right? So that is what we're going to do in our studies. We're going to control for all these factors and see if people still make decisions very differently for renting and buying. Okay, so we started with a very, very simple <coughs> test of our idea. So I basically borrow uh, the website design of Groupon or any other daily deal you're know, aware of and says, well, today in the University of Maryland, we're going to have a daily deal for movies, depending on which group of people you belong to, either for movie rental or for movie purchase. Both of them were digital downloads, no disposal cost. Both of them are priced exactly the same. But you either downloaded it permanently or you downloaded it for 24 hours, like a regular rental. And you have to pay your own money to get that deal. You have to pay a dollar to get the deal. Our expectation was, even though you download exactly the same movie, there is no disposal cost, exactly the same price, people were more willing to pay for rental than pay for purchase, and this is exactly what we find. A lot of my people said yes to this deal when it was framed as a rental, then it was framed as a purchase. So then we did a small follow-up study, which kind of tested the same idea in the same environment, but now we're interested not only in whether you're going to say yes, I'm going to buy, yes, I'm going to rent, but how many products you're going to acquire of the same type, right? That's the kind of next stage. So we had a very similar design. The only difference was we gave them a set of five movies they can look at and they can purchase or rent depending on their condition as many as they wanted to. The other thing we were a little bit concerned with and wanted to check was, well, maybe people feel they're going to get a different quality or different enjoyment in the future from something they're going to buy versus something they're going to rent, right? Maybe if I buy it, I'm going to watch it three times instead of one in 24 hours period. Maybe that's going to affect people's preferences. So we measure both perceived enjoyment as well as perception of quality of movies on top of how many they want to acquire. And we find exactly the same effect on number of movies. People want to acquire more movies for rental than for purchase for the same price, which obviously economically doesn't make any sense. Uh, but there is no difference in perceived enjoyment and, qual and quality <coughs> of those movies. So even though I'm going to rent this movie, I'm going to enjoy it as much as I will if I buy this, bought the same movie. Um, so the next step we did, well, let's go away from sort of movies environment, maybe just specific effects to downloading movies. Maybe people have some strong inherent preference for renting movies or buying movies. That's fine. Let's try it in more sort of conventional rental environment. So we constructed an ad that looks very much similar to the one you see from those render centers. This is actually a very interesting recent example. Amazing TV options happening in May. <laughs> uh, so basically, we presented them with three television options, either for rental or purchase, and say you have you know, these three in front of you. you. Pick one that you like in both conditions. And then what we're interested in seeing is Remember, our proposition was that because people who are in a rental mindset basically use less stringent criteria in terms of what's going to be acceptable for them to take home for rental, there are going to be more options they will say yes to than people who are in buying mindset. So what we did, once the, the consumer saw those three televisions, they picked one, you know, I really like this one, and then we told them, well, sorry, the one you picked is actually out of stock. Situation happens all the time. 
And then what we're really interested in, well, will the second best option going to be acceptable to people, right? And our prediction based on what we kind of figured out about rental and buy-in mindset would be that, well, for people in rental condition, that wouldn't be a big deal, right? A lot more options are actually acceptable. But people in the buying condition, that would be a big deal. And they would be less likely to say yes to their second best alternative. So this is how data looked like. This is a percentage of people who decided to say, well, if you can't give me the first one, I'm just going to defer choice. And that's exactly what I find. Very few people said no to a second best option in the rental condition. But almost a third of participants say, well, if I can't get my first favorite one, I'm not going to take the second best one which is very much consistent with the idea of more elaborate decision-making decision -making for buying, as well as a higher acceptance criteria. So in the final two studies I'm going to show you, we are very excited about so this choice outcomes of our predictions, but we still were very much speculating about the process. We tell you that's decision reversibility, high elaboration, but it really ne never really show you this, except for the choice uh, outcomes. So we decided to measure the decision process. So how exactly people do make those decisions differently then leads to the difference in choice shares. So I'm going to show you two studies together because they're very similar. We went back to our movie industry because it's really easy to manipulate a lot of things here. And we asked essentially two different studies, two different questions. So in the first one, we were interested in how many movies do you have to examine before you decide which one to buy or to rent? So if I gave people a list of 10 movies, they can go back and forth to them, look at them, what they want to do. But at some point, they have said they have to tell us, well, that's enough. I can make my decision. I've seen enough movies. I've made it my decision. And in the second study, we've done it in a law environment. We, again, had a set of list of movies. And we gave some basic information about those movies, cast a couple of pictures. But we also provided them with a link to go to Rotten Tomatoes website, which is a well-known uh, movie review website. And they can spend as much time as they want there. And that's what we measured, how much time you spend getting additional information about your choice option on this independent website. And our prediction for both of those experiments was that consumers who will be facing a buying decision for the same product, for the same price, without disposal cost, will actually spend more time looking at information about individual options and also will have to, to look through more options before making a decision than somebody who's going to be making a rental decision for exactly the same product for exactly the same price. And this is what you find. If you look at the things on your left, this is a number of movies examined before making a choice. If I'm making a buying decision for $4.99, I actually look almost at two more movies before I made a choice if I'm making a rental decision. Again, the set of movies is exactly the same. Uh, the two columns on your right, those are actually the time I spend on Rose and Tomatoes. And if I'm making a buying decision, I spend an average on each movie I reviewed 30 seconds more than if I'm making actually uh, rental decisions. Both of these results are consistent with this notion that if I'm making a buying decision, I take it more seriously. It's a more elaborate decision. My criteria are higher. That's why I have to look through more options before arriving at a decision. Right? So this gives us a little bit more insight into what's actually going in their heads before they make the choices. Right? That's what we show in the study one and two. But probably the most critical piece of our thinking and our theory was this idea of decision permanency or decision reversibility in rental situations. So we told you that we believe all of this happening even when we control for prices, disposal costs, et cetera, because people see buying decision as irreversible, right? So if I can take this piece away from the buying decision, then people should make decisions about renting and buying exactly the same, right? So we done this study, we went back to University of Maryland for this study. Big deal for our juniors is study abroad. Everybody wants to do it, for, you know, Paris, Madrid, all the good stuff. Uh, so basically, we created a fake brochure for them about the room they're going to stay in uh, when they're going to be, um, the dorms they're going to stay when they're going to be traveling abroad. And we told them, well, there are a couple of options you can choose from, furniture, et cetera, et cetera. And the company also offers either rental or purchase options for a little bit of small appliances. And one example that we use as a critical dependent measure for us was this mini fridge. Everybody knows you know, what the mini fridge is. Everybody probably wants it when they are staying in the dorm room to keep, apparently, beer, like in this case or whatever else you want to keep there. Um, so the only difference was you either were buying that for mini fridge for $75, or you were renting for $75 when you were staying there. 
Uh, we manipulated consumption lengths either to be three months, you're going abroad for three months for summer term, or you're going for the whole year to make sure people perceive the consumption length the same. We even covered disposal costs to say, well, when you're done, whether you're in rental or in purchase situation, we're going to pick it up for you. Don't worry about this. But what was critical, besides a traditional rental condition, just rent, just buy, we also added a third condition which simply said, well, you can purchase this fridge for $75, and the company, their tagline, their main advertising point is that they offer unlimited returns. If you don't like it, you can bring it back. That's the only thing with it. So, and the point of this manipulation was to make sure that consumers, in this case students who are thinking about their study abroad situation, understand that buying decision was actually now reversible. If they get the fridge they don't like, they can actually return it. Okay? And our expectation was that, again, we should find a difference between renting and buying condition, just like we find in the first four studies. But then when we introduce this decision reversibility back into buying decisions, this effect should go away. And this is exactly what we find. So the first two columns represent our rent versus buy condition. People were more likely to rent the same fridge for the same price for the same time period than to buy it. But then when we said, well, this buying policy actually involves unlimited return, they were more likely to buy it. Again, the buying share went up uh, significantly. So the key takeaways, I think, here are that consumers do take renting and buying decisions very differently, right? They have huge implications for choice, as well as how they make those decisions in the process. Uh, even this happens in categories where price, disposal costs, consumption lengths is really not an issue. So where economically they shouldn't be favoring rental over buying anyways. And most probably important insight is that marketers, given this, should actually pay attention to the rental industry. It is a huge industry. People make decisions differently. We should be behaving very differently when we advertise or promote products that are targeted to be as rentals versus as purchases. So a couple of things we, I'm not going to show you the results, but a couple of things we played around with that we believe have strong implications. One big that jumps at you is pricing, right? If I'm making decisions less stringently, I apply a different decision criteria, people making rentals will be more accepting and amicable to more premium pricing. At the same time, discounts work much better with buying decisions. And if you're thinking about choice architecture, right, making more elaborate choices, decision process is really important for buying, creating an environment where people feel like they've actually put due diligence before they make buying decisions will work really well for buying, but not so much for rentals. Product categories, right? It feels like in some product categories, this bar is even higher for buying than for renting, particularly hedonic or luxury kind of goods. My first example, bag, bore, or seal, it will take a lot of elaboration on my side to spend money on buying something like expensive designer handbag, but renting kind of feels okay, right? Going back to that example. And finally, in terms of advertising, it seems like highlighting, even very simple, like we did in the last study, this element of possibility of reversibility of buying decision might make them more comparable to rental and increase the choice share they're going to make. And that recently, actually, Chevy campaign done exactly like this, right? A couple of years ago, they had a campaign when they said, well, if you don't like our cars, which is traditionally a buying decision, just bring it back. And that's all I have. And I have a couple of minutes for questions, actually. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Margaret? Mm -hmm. So I think anything that's associated with status and achievement, right? That's why we have a very strong bias towards buying cars or buying houses even in, in the wrong market, right? Is if I own something that says something about me as a person, I actually achieve that. I think that's where we're going to have a strong bias towards buying versus rent. And even though economically not always actually makes sense. Yes. Great presentation. I, uh... Thank you. I uh, just have a question, and this is not really about the study as much as implications of it. Mm -hmm. um, is you think about consumers and millennials, especially, and they have a you know, lower purchasing power than were, was anticipated. You know, the single market home rental 
market has just exploded. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like, again, we've had a lot of, I mean, Elizabeth Warren, had a lot of emphasis on mortgage um, regulations and oversight. Mm -hmm. Is there a need because of this shift and the way that the, the, the rental culture is increasing and then you look at millennials and their propensity to buy and their ability to buy, is there a greater need because of this kind of data to have regulations and have the government get involved to regulate those markets for single home rentals so that consumers are protected against rental as well as buy the same way? Mm -hmm. So I think what is uh, one of the reasons why we see explosion in the rental industry precisely is this, right? People have smaller purchasing power, and that's why the rentals are more appealing. But if you think about something as serious as renting a house, long term, you know, you actually have to think about long term which one is better for you. And I don't think people who are making those decisions about renting places are thinking, well, if I rent for 10 years, what kind of application I'm going to have? They think, well, if I rent this month, I actually can afford it kind of idea. Um, so I think you're right. Maybe for those industry, when it does have long-term implications, people should consider those costs. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, car leasing and Netflix subscriptions, are they seen more as, by the consumer, as more rental uh, or more as purchases? Well, Netflix is clearly a rental, right? I never actually right. own anything that's on so Netflix. So the subscription model would then fall in the rental? Yes, I think it would be. Car leasing is a little bit different because we still, I believe, so going back to market point, have a very strong bias towards buying. No matter whether it's actually financial makes sense or not, it has a status. There's a lot of emotional connotation to it. Um, but I think definitely a subscription model will fall into rental. Thank idea. you. You should answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.